Ernest Hemingway's legacy embodies the author's hunger for life and its experiences. Through his fiction, Hemingway's mark is found across the globe. His impact is felt in a wealth of places from the Sahara Desert to the Gulf Stream, and although these places undoubtedly influenced Ernest Hemingway, modern-day Key West is a product of the author's presence. Fifty years after his death, Hemingway's image can still be found in the city's celebration of the author. In 1927, Ernest Hemingway and his second wife, Pauline Pfeiffer, left Paris to return to the United States. The Hemingway set their sights on Key West, Florida on the recommendation of John Dos Passos, a contemporary and close friend of Ernest Hemingway. For the next three years, Ernest and Pauline traveled between Key West and Pigott, Arkansas, the home of Pauline's parents, Paul and Mary Pfeiffer. Ernest and Pauline maintained a close relationship with the Pfeiffers. In his in-laws, Hemingway found the familial encouragement and financial backing that his own family had failed to provide. Paul and Mary supported Ernest's work. They even converted their barn into a writing studio for Ernest to use during his visits to the farm. Today, the Pfeiffer Estate is maintained by Arkansas State University. The property offers hourly tours of the Pfeiffer home and the grounds. This bedroom inside the Pfeiffer home is the setting of Hemingway's short story, A Day's Wait. The story is only one of many instances in which Hemingway used experiences in his own life as a model for his fiction. The pull of the Gulf Stream proved too strong for Ernest Hemingway, and in 1931 he and Pauline purchased a home at 907 Whitehead Street with the help of Pauline's uncle, Gus Pfeiffer. Key West offered an opportunity for anonymity and isolation, and Hemingway was able to devote more time to his work. In a 1928 letter to his publisher, Maxwell Perkins, Hemingway asked that Maxwell forward several of his books to Key West. Nobody believes me when I say I'm a writer. During his stay in the Florida Keys, Hemingway wrote or worked on several projects, including The Short Happy Life of Francis McCumber, Death in the Afternoon, For Whom the Bell Tolls, and The Snows of Kilimanjaro. His experiences and the people he met in Key West also influenced To Have and Have Not, a 1937 novel about a Gulf Stream fishing boat captain during the Great Depression. True to form, Ernest and Pauline quickly made friends in Key West, and Charles Thompson, the owner of a local hardware store, introduced Hemingway to big game sport fishing. Both Charles Thompson and sport fishing would make a deep impression on Ernest Hemingway, as evidenced by later works, such as The Old Man in the Sea and To Have and Have Not. Today, the Key West community serves as an outlet for many local and regional artists, including both media art and performance art. Although Hemingway invited many of his literary friends to Key West, the community's reputation as an artist retreat is likely an unintended result. I did see a lot of an indirect influence such as Sloppy Joe's, his shirts, or his faces on all of their shirts. But uh, yeah, indirectly he did have a lot to do with sending people that way. In 1934, Julia Stone Jr. was appointed to help revitalize the island, and by 1935, Key West tourist population had increased dramatically. Community members and investors did not miss the opportunity to capitalize on the allure of Ernest Hemingway. His house was added to a tourist attraction map, much to the author's annoyance, and continues to be a major tourist destination. In a 1936 letter to Perkins, Hemingway complained of the influx of visitors. Been driven nuts by visitors this last 10 days. Everything from movie stars up and down, and they have cost me a week's work. His house is, I, I mean, as everybody in the class saw, is a huge tourist attraction. People who didn't exactly know who Hemingway was knew that when you go to Key West, you go to the Hemingway house. So I think either through tourist agencies or just word of mouth, people do realize that Part of Key West is Hemingway, and that, that's part of the experience. The Hemingway Home and Museum is now a major attraction in Key West, operating 365 days a year. Visitors can take a brief step into the home of Ernest and Pauline, visit the outdoor studio, tour the outside gardens, 
and catch a glimpse of the infamous six-toed cats who live on the property. Several local businesses also seize the chance to profit from Hemingway's residence. Both Captain Tony's and Sloppy Joe's offer an inside look into Hemingway's recreational activities. At Sloppy Joe's, photos of Ernest Hemingway line the walls. Its staff also hosts an annual look-alike contest as a part of Hemingway Days, a week-long Hemingway celebration that includes a marlin fishing competition, parties, a short story competition, and a mock running of the bulls. While Hemingway's reaction to celebrations, such as the look-alike contest, might be one of amusement, he was also a man who valued his privacy. In 1949, his mother was contacted for an interview. Hemingway responded to the request by telling her he would withdraw all financial support from her if she gave an interview. I don't think he would, he would appreciate or tolerate it if he was around. And to really be a lover of Hemingway is to maybe own his works instead of his picture. After his divorce from Pauline in 1940, Hemingway left Key West for Cuba, allowing Pauline to keep their house. He and Mary, his fourth wife, returned frequently after Pauline's death, but Hemingway complained to a friend in 1955 that the house depressed him. He would visit the house for the last time in 1960. Ernest Hemingway's experience in the southern United States had a great effect on the author. As thousands of visitors flock to the Oceanside town each year, the author's lingering presence is felt through the sights and sounds of Key West.